Good morning or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Nicolas Veron. It's my pleasure to welcome you all at the, the session of the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute. And as usual, with a lot of thanks to all the, the team at the Institute, which makes it possible, Jessica Parada and uh, Lily Day at the meeting team, uh, Rebecca Ackerman, uh, all the publications team, Helen Hillebrand, uh, and, uh, and others. Um, today, we will discuss regulation of financial services firms, which we do almost uh, in every session, uh, but there's specifically the debate, which is very active these days on regulating entities versus regulating activities. And that's a bit of a code word for a number of policy challenges that we'll explore today with Fernando Restoy and Anna Gelper. And Fernando Restoy uh, is now the chairman of the Financial Stability Institute in Basel. And I think uh, you're joining us from Basel, Fernando, right? Um, right. And um, he studied economics at the University Complutense in Madrid, also at the London School of Economics, got his PhD in economics at Harvard in 1991, and then had the distinguished career at the Bank of Spain, uh, initially in the research department, where, of which he became the head, uh, and uh, also uh, teaching in parallel at the University Complutense and uh, Carlos III in Madrid. And then in 2007, he left the Bank of Spain for a few years, which uh, I have to say makes him one of the few Spanish regulators who haven't been associated with any supervisory failures uh, during the period leading to the um, uh, restructuring uh, actions of 2012. Uh, he was at the Comisión Nacional del Mercado de Valores, uh, the CNMV, the securities regulator uh, in, uh, in Madrid and then came back to the Bank of Spain in 2012 uh, as vice governor in charge of uh, supervisory and financial stability issues and also as the chairman of the newly formed uh, resolution authorities, uh, Fondo de Restructuración and Ordenada Bancaria, the FROB, uh, which he uh, led until uh, the establishment of uh, a, a, a separate chairman from the Bank of Spain in 2015. Uh, so as I said, uh, Fernando Restoy has uh, chaired the Financial Stability Institute since 2017. Uh, the Financial Stability Institute is kind of the in-house think tank of the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, if I can put it that way. Uh, and I have to say with no offense to the previous era that uh, uh, Fernando Restoy has uh, uh, injected a lot of uh, energy and creativity into the Financial Stability Institute, whose uh, papers in the last few years uh, have become reference point for a number of uh, important debates about financial stability, financial regulation, and the supervision of financial firms, uh, which, uh, which I certainly have benefited uh, from a lot. Also with us today, uh, and not for the first time, is Anna Gelpern, uh, my colleague at the Peterson Institute and the Professor of Law and Agnes Williams, Research Professor at uh, Georgetown Law School at the Georgetown University Law Center. Um, and um, she also uh, studied at Harvard before that at Princeton, but uh, on the law track. Uh, and she practiced law in New York, in London, uh, before uh, joining uh, the public policy world, uh, world uh, in the 1990s at the Council on Foreign Relations at the US Treasury. Uh, and uh, then she went back to an academic career at American University, Washington College of Law, at Rutgers uh, Law School, and uh, also with visiting positions at Harvard and uh, University of Pennsylvania. So we're, I couldn't think of a better uh, panel to discuss our topic today. And I will um, hand over the floor to Fernando. Uh, Fernando, I think I will be handling your slides, if that's OK. Uh, and uh, let me share my screen uh, to do that. Uh, Fernando, over to you. Okay, uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a real pleasure to participate in this seminar series. Very, thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for your kind introduction and particularly for your invitation uh, to be part of this very prestigious, uh, this prestigious um, gathering. So I think um, it's, I don't need actually to spend too much time in terms of, uh, of an introduction of the topic. I think it's clear to almost everyone that the emergence of fintechs and, and big techs in particular constitutes a, a sort of um, a source of disruption in the market for financial services, a major source of disruption. I would say that regulators are 
now in the process of adjusting the regulatory perimeters to address, to address the risk generated by new players, new products, and new technologies with a view uh, also of trying to preserve the good things, the benefits that those developments also bring in terms of um, competition, in terms of um, efficiency, and also eventually also financial inclusion. But there is a sense, of course, that uh, we may need uh, at some point a comprehensive regulatory framework, a new comprehensive regulatory framework for, for big techs in particular, for those platforms which, which offer a wide variety of financial and non-financial um, services. And also that this comprehensive um, approach should try to minimize competitive distortions that could unduly penalize either incumbents or the, the new, the new the new players. So, so next slide, please, uh, Nicola. So, what is this? Um, what is actually this paper about? I mean, you can see uh, actually uh, that when looking at this new comprehensive framework, many people are using what they call the slogan, which has gained much success. The slogan is same activity, same regulation. And you have heard this many times, uh, been, not only from the industry itself. But also for some regulators, and we have some quotes here in the in the slides. So what is that? What does it mean in practice? Well, um, by saying same activity, same regulation, I think uh, people want to stress the need to somehow move from the current regulatory framework, which arguably in some domains is pretty much based on imposing requirements on entities which have a specific charter, a specific license, what we call an entity-based regulation to move from there to a new uh, sort of approach under which you will, you will actually impose a specific rules for people performing a specific activity. And basically the same rules to all different players in that particular market segment, to all different um, agents or agencies or entities performing that particular activity, what we call, uh, what we call activity-based regulation. So let's just slide this, Nicola. So the, the, this paper is basically about um, exploring the limits of this activity-based regulatory approach. I mean, what we have, the entity, the so-called entity-based approach. And, and if you allow me to uh, interrupt you, Fernando, uh, I should have said it in my introduction, but this paper is a paper you uh, published uh, last month at the Financial Stability Institute, FinTech Regulation, How to Achieve a, a Level Playing Field. So uh, I think we included a link in the invitation, but that's, uh, that's just as a, a reminder for those who are joining us in course. Right. So it explains the title of this slide, this paper. So this is the paper Nicola was referring to. Yes, it's about exploring the limits of this activity-based regulatory approach. Um, there is a first question we want to address, which is, well, um, to the extent that the entity-based approach should actually have a policy rationale, are we, can we safely actually sort of um, replacing that uh, by a new regulatory approach based on activities rather than on entities? And depending very much on the answer to this first question, um, you could actually address the second question, which is in that uh, following this, what will it, will it then the right approach in order to guarantee a sufficient level playing field in order to minimize at least any, any sort of competitive distortions between commercial banks and the new fintech or big tech uh, players. Um, next slide, please. So, Okay, I'm not going to spend very much on this, just to basically show we use a table in a, in a different uh, paper, but we are going, we, we are going to publish, actually next week will be published, we basically review the current regulatory approaches in relation to big techs in different, in different jurisdictions, just to basically to show that it's obviously not true that the big techs actually provide financial services without any type of uh, license without having to comply with a specific regulation. They do have to comply with a specific regulation. They do have to hold licenses to be able actually to offer uh, services in regulated areas. Um, the question here, of course, is whether this is enough, whether the current actually regulatory framework is satisfactory in all, in all relevant policy respects. Next slide. So in order to address this question, um, let me just uh, go very quickly through a few what they call conceptual preliminaries. 
First is about the relevance of the level playing field. Of course, it's an important, actually, objective for all policymakers in all policy domains, uh, I should say. But it's clear that in general, this is not considered a primary policy objective. Typically, typically regulators tend to believe that level playing field issues are subordinated to other higher priority policy goals, such as financial stability, market integrity, or even for, for competition. Actually, um, it's clear that sometimes um, authorities responsible for financial stability, say, or other policy areas, they feel that they have to treat the unequal, unequally enable, in order to be able to do a good job in, term, in terms of uh, preserving, in order to be able like, to meet the primary policy objectives. But even in the, in the area of competition, you know that sometimes there are specific requirements which are imposed on specific competitors, on specific market players, to the extent that because of other activities those players perform, they may have a larger potential to get into anti-competitive practices. So not even acting the competition level playing field is necessarily a primary, uh, a primary objective. It is true though that in some policy domains, and I mentioned in the paper and explain why the areas of uh, uh, anti-money laundering or the area of consumer protection, well, when we do basically consider those regulatory domains, there is little actually policy rational to uh, explain possible discrepancies in the requirements to be satisfied by different types of players. I mean, there is no, not an easy way actually to justify that. But in other domains, certainly financial stability is one, I mentioned competition, also, also operational resilience, there could be a good case actually just to discriminate or to introduce differences in the requirements to be satisfied by different types of, of entities. This is because the same activity performed by different types of entities may actually generate different types of risks. I think about financial stability, think about credit underwriting, for instance. Well, it's clear that it's not the same if credit is, 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 is given by, say, a tech company, which is fully funded by own resources, than when it is actually, this activity is performed by a commercial bank, which is funded by, by deposits uh, taken from the, from the public. So uh, the risks associated to the second type of entity is very different to the to the risk associated to the first uh, entity, first type of entities, even if they do perform the same activity. And this is because it is sometimes uh, the combination of activities which is actually relevant from the point of view of risk. So um, risk do not only come from the performance of particular activity. Risk in many cases come from the combination of activities that different entities perform. And when this is the case, is when you need actually an entity-based approach. So that means, of course, that um, some regulatory discrepancies uh, for, for different entities performing a particular uh, activity can be fully justified on, 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 on policy grounds, on primary policy grounds. Um, but of course, but of course um, this is not always the case. It is not the case when you have those discrepancies in areas where an activity-based approach is fully warranted, as I, as I said before, AML or consumer protection, or even in areas where you should go for an entity-based approach, when you impose entity-based rules in some classes of entities, but you don't impose corresponding entity-based rules for other classes of entities. They don't have to be the same, but it could well be the case that different classes of entities should actually be subject to different types of entity-based uh, rules. And this may be relevant in the case of, of big techs, to the extent you could consider that the combination of activities that big, big tech platforms actually perform may generate specific risks that merit uh, a specific entity-based rules. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So what is the evidence? So we already ob we observe in practice those different types of unwarranted regulatory discrepancies. Well, let's look at the first element, the, the, what happens with activity-based uh, rules in policy areas where activity-based regulation is warranted. Say, I mentioned before, AML safety and consumer protection. Well, what happens right now, in, at least in Europe and, 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 the, and the United States, in most parts of the world, is that basically AML rules apply to a wide variety, actually, of financial uh, service uh, providers. The rules currently in place in, in, in most jurisdictions derive directly from international standards 
the ones produced by, by Fatah. And those standards actually are very clear about imposing obligations in terms of, of, of record tracking, in terms of uh, transparency, in terms of um, the reporting of suspicious transactions, in terms of KYC, know your customer, all those type of rules, all type of standards actually apply to essentially all professional providers of financial services. And in the case of consumer protection, it's not different. I mean, big techs typically have specific licenses to perform specific regulated activities. Uh -huh. And when they do actually, when they do actually all these licenses, they of course have to follow a specific consumer protection rules as, as it is the case for all different providers of the same type of service. So I think it's a, um, when you look at those rules in, in, for AML CFT, for consumer protection, it's not easy to identify sort of unwarranted discrimination, unwarranted discrepancies, differences, or the uh -huh. requirement to be satisfied by different types of entities. There could be though, of course, some um, issues in relation to the enforcement, monitoring, supervision of the rules. But this has to do with architectural supervision, um, particularly the fragmentation of supervision across different se sectoral authorities more than about the, the rules themselves. But this is not the case, actually, when, when we look at uh, we look at the entity-based uh, rules. But we can identify here some areas in which it is absolutely legitimate to consider that some specific entity-based based rules could actually be imposed on big techs. For instance, operational resilience. I mean, of course, the different legal entities within the big tech groups have to satisfy some requirements in the field of operational resilience. But in principle, lack is sort of a comprehensive uh, approach under which the rules will also take into account the risk emerging from the combination of activities that big tech perform from operational resilience point of view. So we don't have for big tech something similar to what we have actually for, for banks, where we actually focus on the risk generated by, by all activities that the banks perform. Mm -hmm. And very clear on competition. On competition, I think right now the approach, you know this well, is that typically competition authorities tend to base their decisions on case laws. Basically mm -hmm. what happens is there is an application of the general principle to a specific cases, but this is not typically exposed. If you really consider that is a large potential for big techs to get into anti-competitive practices, given its particular business model based on data superiority, network externalities, et cetera, it could have, there is a good case to consider to impose ex ante some requirements and obligations that should, they should satisfy in order to preserve, to preserve competition, fair competition in a particular, in a particular market. And actually, uh, we don't have much of, 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 of that. So those are the, the, the issues, not much action, uh, not much gaps, not, 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 not many actually uh, problems identified when we compare activity-based regulation in areas in which activity-based regulation is warranted, but there could be an issue in terms of other policy areas in which an entity-based approach is actually warranted. We have that for banks that we don't have similar thing for, for big techs. But fortunately, we have seen some initiatives that clearly go in the direction of introducing a specific entity-based rules for big techs. And this is, for instance, the case of the- Fernando, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to move to the conclusion because we want to, to have the, the debate on this. So if you can go relatively quickly on, uh, on these examples and we'll come back to them in the Q&A. Very good, okay. So I was mentioning these examples, what is coming in the US with this recommendation by the, by the House of Representatives the guideline in China, the guidance using, uh, issued by, by SAMAR, basically the market regulator authority, and also by the People Bank of China, basically introducing specific requirements in the area of competition for, for uh, big techs, and certainly in the, European, in, the, in the European Union, these initiatives by the European Commission uh, in the form of a, of a draft Digital Markets Act and also the Digital Services Act. I must say that in the case of the European Union, of course, the Digital Services Act goes somewhat further and they do not only try to introduce requirements in the area of competition, but also actually to, to introduce a specific controls that will also try to address issues uh, that could emerge in the area of operational, operational resilience. My last slide is about the uh, key takeaways. Maybe you want to just to put it there. 
but I won't repeat them for, for the sake of, of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And um, uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, I mean, I have a lot of questions and there are many, uh, I think, from the, from the floor. So um, immediately over to you, Anna. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and it's, uh, it's an honor indeed to uh, be on this uh, panel. I've been an avid consumer of uh, uh, BIS, and particularly the financial stability uh, research output, um, for which I'm deeply grateful. I'm especially grateful for this paper because I think that it brings together uh, a number of uh, important issues that are not always discussed um, together. And to me, the big persistent um, challenge is uh, really to understand something that you started with. How is it that we got snookered into this set of slogans that um, posit a false choice between entity and activity regulation? who inserted the or in that uh, phrase and, and why on earth that makes any sense is something that I'm really struggling to understand. I mean, we do not talk about the choice between, um, you know, traffic rules, licensing drivers, and the amount of blood alcohol in, uh, uh, you know, that uh, you may have as you drive. So I am not sure why, again, activities and entities uh, are somehow posed as a choice. What I do um, want to push on a little bit further is um, while I agree entirely, I think, with your, um, with the takeaways from the paper and the need for balance and the need for flexibility. And uh, in some sense, I take it to, argue for um, kind of an adaptive all of the above approach uh, when it comes to fintech. Um, I do want to try to unpack um, the way in which we um, choose regulatory tools and regulatory approaches um, in the context of innovation, financial, technical, and otherwise. So. Um, you know, the first big question is why regulate at all, right? So you're the focus on objectives. And there, I think um, my first puzzle was right in your title. And then there's a, a, a point that you've made um, about the where there seems to be some distinction between level playing field and fair competition, right? And so I would love to hear you elaborate on that. Um, my starting position was, well, um, sort of, you know, all men are created equal, but I'm not sure why all um, you know entities and special purpose vehicles are entitled to a level playing field as a general proposition, sort of a kind of a natural law moment there. Um, the second question I think is one that we spend a lot of time on, and I think that's the one where the political economy issues um, uh, are super salient, and that is whom do we regulate, right? Um, there, I think that um, you made a really strong case about you know different kinds of entities performing uh, the same activity may very well present different kinds of risk, um, and certainly some some entities that perform a combination activities would present a very different uh, set of risks regardless of how they're organized. Um, but another. Um, question that I've been struggling with, and uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, recently put out a paper on this in the consumer finance space, is how do we get at the decision makers, right? Because one of the things we've seen, and I think BIS has certainly put out some really interesting work on this, is um, a disaggregation of balance sheets and decision making um, and uh, the the sort of the incidence of the the impact of the activity that um, uh, is going on, and so uh, you know certainly very often there's a very deliberate um, kind of design decision to separate human agency from a given balance sheet and from a given activity, 
And regulation has got to be able to get to the decision makers, whether it is via the balance sheet, via you know, uh, encouraging or prohibiting certain activities, um, but it is the decision making that we're trying to get it. And the best way of, uh, uh, of doing it is, is, I think, selecting that as a challenge. Um, the third set of questions um, goes to how we regulate, right? And this is where I think there's a fair amount of, of kind of conceptual terminological uh, confusion in um, uh, the literature and the policy discussion um, because how and whom are two different questions. So just because you're regulating an entity, of course, as you said, doesn't mean that you have, you know, capital and liquidity regulation, right? You can have entity regulation that is all about, say, governance, right? Or operational resilience uh, in the system sense. Um, entity regulation does not, need not, should not mean, um, uh, you know, supplemental leverage ratios. Um, but it certainly, um, does entail us, uh, there is a toolkit um, that uh, is that is uh, predicated on um, an entity um, uh, interlocutor, if you will. Uh, and, and I think the, the choice of tools there is important. Um, next to last is who regulates. So the whom, right, is the target of regulation. Um, and the decision maker and the uh, ultimate entity, but who regulates, I think is also super important. Um, and uh, whether the particular regulator or regulators um, have it as part of the mission, as part of the culture and um, to in fact, engage with these entities, these activities to the uh, and that we articulate at the outset as the regulatory objective. And of course, I often think about in the context of that thing you, that used to be known as shadow banking, the SEC in the United States is not a financial stability regulator. It may be adapting in certain ways to do that, uh, to sort of be that, but it's, uh, it's a lot to ask for agencies like that to turn on a dime, you know, certainly FTC and, and similar. Uh, whether these agencies have, again, the expertise, the culture, but also the resources um, and the coordination capacity in this world where different entities engage in a plethora of activities, I think is, is a question and a challenge. And then finally, you've addressed this, and I think it's important to um, keep coming back to it, is uh, when to regulate, right? When to intervene. Um, and here again, this is, I think I'm just circling back to my initial puzzlement with um, false choices. Uh, we're often presented with the choice of ex ante regulation, um, ex ante licensing rather, or you know, ex post intervention taxation uh, restrictions. Um, very often we don't have the information ex ante and certainly in the space um, of uh, you know perennial active innovation, uh, I think it is a lot to um, ask for to just to limit uh, regulatory intervention and oversight to uh, licensing only or to ex ante um, sort of parameter setting. It's a recipe for uh, for arbitrage in a world of uh, freedom of contract, right? Huh? But um, ex post regulation has to deal with um, questions such as, you know, sort of what is the intervention threshold? And then, um, you know, this concern about do we gradually, um, uh, sort of you can gradually increase, you know, taxes, capital charges and things like that, um, or you could uh, uh -huh. go into prohibition. Um, which is a bit more discontinuous. But these are all the questions that this uh, super useful and thought-provoking paper raised for me. I would love to hear your, um, your thoughts and of course the uh, questions from the audience, which tend to be really good. Indeed, uh, thanks so much, Anna, and many questions already from the audience. Fernando, um, I won't ask you to answer all Anna's questions, but, uh, but I 
I'd like you to focus maybe on the, on the one before last, which is uh, who is the regulator and can you give a sense of how you see the new landscape of uh, supervisory uh, authorities emerging with the challenges you outline in your paper, especially with the interplay between financial stability, uh, competition and data uh, and, uh, and cyber security and operational uh, re regulation. Uh, are we at risk as, at having a, an unmanageable uh, number of cooks in the kitchen? And how do you think about that challenge? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne, for your very insightful uh, comments. Um, I, I think I agree, actually, with the sort of the view that uh, emerges from your question, even if you are not directly answering them. Let me just basically say that I fully agree, before I get to the question, uh, Nicola, but uh, I fully agree with uh, your point that probably what is probably mad is not really sensible, is just to consider, you know, activity-based and PT-based as a sort of uh, one or the other. It's clear, it's something I hope is clear in, the, in this paper, is that we need both. And actually that we could actually identify the right criteria to see in which domains we need activity-based and which other domains we need some sort of an entity-based type of type of uh, type of approach. Um, I'm going to your question about uh, uh, supervisor or regulatory architecture, which is of course an incredibly challenging uh, topic. It's not by, by accident I don't cover this uh, too much in depth in the in the paper itself because I think it has to it needs much more reflection. Um, having said that, I mean when we talk about entity-based. Approach it does not mean that we need a supervisor, a single supervisor, just to cover all different aspects of the of the of the, of the actions and activities and decisions taken by specific entities. Um, could be the case. I think to some extent, not fully, to some extent, in, in China, the People Bank of China is taking much responsibility in different areas. Certainly, in what respects operational resilience or the risks of big techs as providers of financial services, and actually, you know, a recent decision to ask the Ant Group to become a financial holding company that will imply that all their activities, all its activities will be subject to the supervision oversight of, uh, of the People Banks of China, and also they are active in the competition domain. So that could be a possible model. I don't believe it's a realistic one, right? In the case of Europe, uh, this is somehow different. I mean, you have two pieces. One is the Digital Market Act, the other one is the Digital Services Act. All of them, of course, both of them are still under discussion. But it clearly separates those two, those, those, those two areas. One is competition, the other one is this which have to do basically with resilience. And the, what is implicit in the, in the European Commission proposal is that it's, it's still the competition authorities will be the ones looking at the monitoring and the supervision of compliance of the big techs with the new extante rules that uh, are introduced in the, in, the, in the Digital Markets Act itself. So it's that imposing a specific extante requirements and competition authorities in principle should be the ones actually looking at, looking at that. In what respects the other source of risk, the, the ones which have more to do with operational resilience, I mean, they are actually sort of inviting member states to put in place a specific ad hoc supervisory regime for this. So they introduce requirements in terms of risk management, in terms of governance, in terms of audit. Uh, they also specify a supervisory regime. So that means, of course, that while both the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act are actually fully compliant with the, with the, with the need or the, with the, with the objective of introducing entity-based rules, they uh, all those two acts together basically consider that we don't need a single supervisor to take care of all of those two different aspects of the activity performed by entity, by, 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 by big techs. Anna, uh, uh, sorry, uh, go ahead, Fernando. No, I don't know why you want me to go into the, the issue about when to intervene. I think it's a very interesting, a very interesting topic as well, but up to you. You want me to address yeah, that question ahead. as well? And, yep. Yeah. When to intervene, That's, I think this, this is key. Um, and, and particularly in the area of competition. Um, in competition, as I said before, it's clear the, the user approach is that you have general competition principles and then you have case law. Basically, you have competition authorities 
that uh, analyze a particular situation and decide whether this is in line or not with the high level competition principle. Well, I think that uh, such an approach actually is pretty risky in this particular domain, given the huge potential of big techs actually to distort completely the marketplace. So I think that all the initiatives I mentioned before go in the direction of introducing a specific ex-ante requirement in terms of product bundling, in terms of price discrimination, access criteria. Sometimes they even actually consider the possibility of introducing bans for the big tech platform themselves to advertise or to offer their own services in their in the platforms they manage. So this type of restrictions that will actually mitigate clearly the risk of these guys, these big techs, sort of performing anti-competitive uh, practices uh, with the idea, which I think it makes sense, that if you, you, you actually adopt the usual approach and then just act exposed, that may be too late. And that you'll be unable actually to, by doing that, but to prevent the, 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 or to mitigate the risks that big techs could generate for the contestability of the markets in which they, they, they operate. And this is something that apparently is common in the, in the US approach, in the House report, is in the European Commission proposal, as well as in the actions taken in, in China. Anna, uh, I'd like to have your view specifically on this issue of um, how to look at competition in the financial system, because in a way that's a very old uh, question whether given the peculiarities of competition in finance, uh, competition policy should be enforced by the normal cross-sectoral competition authorities or by financial uh, stability authorities when it comes to uh, implementation into financial sector. Uh, and, and clearly the US and, uh, and Europe uh, historically have taken different routes to that, uh, to that question. So how do you think about this? Um, you know, this is an area where I, I think I have the, the fewest priors um, apart from uh, coming from this difference that you mentioned between uh, the way the US and, and Europe approach this. Um, look, I certainly think that today's topic, right? So that if you bring fintechs uh, into the conversation, um, uh, it it's awfully hard to justify a, a fragmented approach, right? So um, I think that- Sorry, just for clarification, what do you mean by a fragmented approach? Well, I, I mean that if you, that it is, uh, I think that you have entities uh, that would be, um, uh, that would be regulated from the sort of competition perspective by one agency, until they, got into, right? Right, until they got into finance and then all of a sudden it would be another. I mean, I think okay. that the real answer has got to be um, that it needs to be dynamic and coordinated, which is sort of like saying we should all eat salad and you know drink milk. But, uh, but I'm not sure that there is a, uh, a different answer to this. Right? I think that um, uh, fragmenting the... Uh, so the regulatory intervention um, is uh, is not uh, is is too risky, um, and I also think that the pace of change is just um, it is such that uh, you know we can't afford to have uh, these kinds of silos. So I think this is where you know I would I would want to rethink the U.S. approach uh, from that perspective. So we have a question from Martin Chorzempa, uh, which is about the separation of banking and commerce, which is a very American uh, legal concept, uh, but has led to the regulation of uh, financial holding companies in the US, and not just to banks and insurance companies and financial entities. And in Europe and other parts of the world, there has been less of a separation historically, which has led banks, for example, to be uh, owned partly or fully by um, you know, non-financial conglomerates. Uh, we have had some examples of that in uh, Portugal, Greece, and other uh, countries. Um, how, maybe that's a question to you, Fernando, and given your European background uh, in terms of the um, European legal framework, uh, should, the, should the emergence of these new actors, uh, big tech platforms, 
leads the European Union to rethink its approach to financial uh, conglomerates and how uh, the, the, the very uh, framework for financial holding companies uh, is set up. Yeah. Well, um, what, um, what is now actually the situation in Europe is that certainly big techs only rarely uh, actually hold banking licenses. Um, and that somehow simplifies a little bit the, the situation. So um, I don't think actually from that point of view, although technically actually those uh, big techs do have actual licenses, but particularly as payment service providers. Um, well, I mean, the, the uh, sort of indications or the sort of the problems that this may generate by the combination of this type of activities of uh, payment service uh, provide, payment service, for instance, with other non-financial activities, probably has uh, much less, uh, much less uh, uh, problems than actually just combining, say, banking with insurance or with uh, other non-financial activities, right? So that means that, to some extent, it's not about, in principle, there's a prudential issues raised by sort of the, com the combination of uh, financial and non-financial activities by this type of uh, by this type of entities in Europe, at least. Um, in China, it's a different thing. We know that. That's why they are going to go in the route of the, of the financial holding company. But in Europe, it's not the case. But therefore, I think we need a sort of a brand new approach. And that's why I think it's a good idea what the proposal of the European Commission. I mean, let's not try to use old categories to deal with new issues. I mean, what we are talking about is completely the new world. And we have these new giants that make use of this huge data superiority that they can actually take advantage of network externalities. And in doing that, they may distort heavily, actually, the marketplace on one side. And second, actually, by combining these type of different types of activities, they could actually sort of generate some of the risk and have to do basically cooperation or resilience. So let's try actually to understand better what is a new landscape and to sort of put in place new categories, new reg regulatory categories that could, that could address the new risk in an effective, in an effective uh, way. I have several questions on, um, on the semantics of the distinction between entity-based and uh, activity-based and especially how that applies to um, operational issues. So cloud computing, usage, uh, that's a question from uh, Alwin Adicio, um, should that be regulated and using an entity-based or an activity-based approach? And uh, there's also an anonymous uh, question on um, uh, operational resilience, right? I mean, how do you, how do you think about, um, I, I, uh, I read the question, um, the, in, in the UK, the policy approach to operational resilience is about to be published. The opportunity would be to apply that to where activities are materially the same or pose similar risks, regardless of providers. So is not your example of operational resilience a good case where the principle of same activity, same risk, same regulation is not applied, but could be? Uh, and, um, and how do you think about that? Yeah. Okay, it's a good, it's a good question. Again, okay, we are now in the process of seeing uh, initiatives in different jurisdictions, not only in the UK for sure, that try to improve markedly actually the regulation of operational resilience. Right? I mean, we are relatively now we go for a much broader type of approach in which we focus not only on banks, but as banks or insurance companies, insurance companies, but we try actually to to put to put forward a sort of more comprehensive and an internally consistent framework, right, uh, to address this. The, that will be applied, and that will be applied for sure for those uh, subsidiaries, those legal entities within actually uh, big tech groups that hold, for instance, licenses of payment service provider, you know, payment institution, or demand institution. In the case of the European, in the case of the European Union, or money transmitter in the case of the of, of the US. But the issue here, so that is more or less activity based, if I if I put it that way. But the point here is whether actually you apply uh, or you consider that there are risks emerging from the different combination of activities that a particular entity performs. For instance, when it comes to banks, I mean, you may consider, right, you consider how activity performed in a particular, uh, by a particular legal entity within the banking group could actually generate risk for the whole group. 
So you have a comprehensive approach I try to address this risk. In the case of big techs, you could in principle consider exactly the same that, I mean, they conduct so many activities. They sell insurance at the same time. They, of course, they, you know, they are in the e-commerce business and they actually sell, sell also wealth management services as well as payments, whatever. I mean, the idea is you have to explore whether there is a sort of possibility of contagion across different types of activities that could generate risk out of that combination of activities which cannot be addressed if you go activity by activity. And certainly one important actually area to look at very carefully is precisely cloud computing services. So that to extend you have actually big tech group providing those type of cloud computing services, it is important that you actually sort of address whether actually the, a, a, this particular service could be affected by the disruption of other activities that the group could actually perform. That would be key. But you need, they really need this reflection. I'm, and I'm, I suspect at the end, you will end up with uh, the conclusion that you need a comprehensive group-wide type of approach also for big techs, as you have now for commercial banks. Anna? So uh, I, I sort of find myself a little bit arguing against language here. Um, the And I, I want to connect this to the previous question about banking and commerce. Um, you've got to ask what motivates a particular um, prohibition, a particular division, or even a particular semantic classification, right? So there's no, like, there's a very specific um, uh, reason why in the United States we have the particular approach that we have to banking and commerce combination and uh, that we address it in this particular way of, for you know, prohibiting certain types of organizations and combinations and you know, the business of banking activities and all of that, right? So I think it's actually quite a useful, um, quite a useful frame. If what you're worried about is power concentration, right? You could in fact, um, deal with it through this lens of banking and commerce. And, uh, you know, the cloud computing is actually a really interesting example, given the kind of the data implications and, uh, and all that. But, um, but then if your concern is conflicts, for example, right, or if your concern is so that, uh, you know, the uh, commercial firm will, uh, you know, use the uh, uh, banking to gain advantage in the commercial field or would uh, make bad loans and would, uh, you know, endanger the, the banking part of the outfit, um, well, then you would intervene in a very different way. So I think we have to be super careful. And Nicole, I know you do this, uh, you focus on this a lot, just not to get bogged down in the translation exercise. There is no magic to entities, activities, banking, commerce. These are all defined terms that um, actually mean somewhat different things in different institutional contexts. And I think what you have to go back to each and every time in a somewhat tiresome way is, well, what are we worried about? Are we worried about too much power? Are we worried about a, a you know, string of bank runs? Are we worried about consumer data getting, uh, you know, gobbled up and uh, sold and abused, right? Those are very different concerns that any of which might under some circumstances in a given institutional setting be addressed by um, something like the banking and commerce, um, uh, you know, constraints, but could also be addressed in, in many different ways depending on the institutional setup. But Anna, isn't the question a bit um, whether we have the luxury of separating all these different aims, right? Because uh, I think what we've seen is uh, the data platforms, uh, those giant companies, which are very agile, very nimble, uh, being able to arbitrage regulatory silos very quickly in a way that legislation cannot follow. So as uh, Jose Maria Roldan uh, is uh, putting it in one of the questions in the Q&A, uh, so legislators always come too late. Uh, so my understanding of the Digital Services Act, in particular in the, in the, Euro, uh, in the European Union, which is not adopted and uh, far from finalized, is that it's a way to, to, to take this holistic approach 
saying, well, the regulator is super powerful and then uh, they will have to adjust on circumstances because precisely this division by mandates uh, could be ineffective given the speed uh, at which uh, things evolve. How do you think about that? I don't think that there's a contradiction, right? Because I think that even if you have one, so, and I mean, if anything, we sort of learned this in all of the um, structure of supervision debates of like 10 years ago and 15 years ago, right? So if you have one super regulator, there is still a classification that they engage in. There's still a sort of a set of typologies that they engage with in how they approach particular problems. So if you have multiple regulators, they better have, um, as Fernando you know, talked about, a um, comprehensive consolidated oversight um, regime right, that would, that would allow them to adapt precisely to the sorts of risks that, uh, that you just flagged. And if you have, uh, you know, one uber super meta regulator, right, you still have to ensure um, both internal and external accountability that they're engaged with particular risks that materialize, right, just because right. you have one uh, mega regulator doesn't mean that they're attending to all the risks. It just means right. it's a big black box. Um, I should, by the way, apologize to our viewers who use uh, a streaming platform. Uh, I don't think we had that problem on Zoom, but for those who looked at this on streaming, we had uh, severe technical issues today, uh, and uh, that meant that uh, part of our discussion could not be viewed uh, in real time. Uh, we apologize profusely for this. We will uh, analyze what happened. It's uh, bizarre, uh, but uh, fortunately, we'll have the full recording, so you can uh, you can view the full session in replay uh, once this is finished. But again, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I have a question from Jeffrey Cutler um, on um, you know if uh, financial regulatory agencies or actually other agencies, but particularly those tasks with financial regulation are left behind in terms of skills, right? I mean, they need the expertise to supervise FinTech, Big Tech. Uh, these skills are uh, expensive. Uh, they are hard to find. There's a lot of competition for them. Um, Fernando, how do you think about that? Is that, is that such a constraint that it should uh, have an impact on how we think about the supervisory mandates and regulatory architectures? Is uh, the difficulty to have the right people? It is always uh, clearly a, a constraint, and certainly supervisors, of course, at the FSI will have close contact with uh, many of them around the world, right? They are all putting in place now sort of capacity building initiatives to try to fill that gap, which is quite quite important. Even if they don't have now in general to supervise big techs, but still they have to they have to supervise uh, a banking industry which now has changed dramatically because of the intensive use of new new technologies, right? And also there is a sense that uh, technology itself can be an important supervisory tool. And this is interesting what is going on in several jurisdictions, and what is happening in the field of tech and using technology itself basically to, to improve the, the efficiency of supervisory work. So there is uh, some action in that domain, certainly it's an important consideration. Uh, we have to be very pragmatic about that. But frankly speaking, at this stage, what, uh, we are not yet in a, situation in a position in which we could actually understand fully what are the needs of supervisors. Because we lack, as we have this discussion, discussion is actually showing, we lack, a, we lack a conceptual sort of agreement on how regulation should change. We do know, we do agree that it has to change, but we need a concern of how regulation should actually change and how the responsibilities of different supervisory agencies should naturally evolve to be consistent with the new regulatory regulatory uh, framework. And to me, I think it's already high time actually to do that. Um, the question before, yes, there's a reason we are getting too late. Yeah, we're already getting too late. That's, that's for sure, but let's try actually to minim minimize the delay. So that uh, entails sort, sort of not easy discussions that we are seeing here in terms of uh, in terms of the fundamentals of regulation, the objectives, as Sandra was saying, uh, what is the right actually sort of uh, uh, concepts and principles that should be followed by, by regulation how the mandates of regulatory authorities should actually evolve. We need all this. And certainly to put in place a sort of coordination mechanisms across different types of regulators. We are not going to end up with a single regulator for everything. That's almost for sure. 
but certainly we have to see the way actually just to enhance our, the coordination mechanisms across different regulatory agencies within jurisdictions and also at the global level, of course. Anna? So I, um, I'm not an economist and so I don't, um, uh, I think that gives me sort of the luxury of saying, I don't see why we should be so hyper-focused on um, sort of buying the most expensive talent that would otherwise want to be in the financial industry. I think that it is far from obvious that the people you want to regulate, to be, uh, you know, regulators are the same people that um, can, can kind of have the uh, skill set and the disposition to, um, you know, be in on oh, Wall Street and similar. Um, well, but I, maybe maybe I didn't ask the questions the right way because there is also the question of whether. The current bunch of um, executives at the regulatory agencies, which are motivated, as you imply, by public service and the like, um, okay. whether they're left behind uh, with all this technology stuff, they're still living in the 20th century, pardon my friend, uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, how, how to manage, basically, how to, how to adapt the human infrastructure of those agencies beyond the question of competition with better paying uh, employers. I, well, I, I I think that it's a per, it's a perennial challenge, and I think another thing that we need to be careful about is uh, sort of framing this as uh, kind of the first um, uh, sort of a, the brand new paradigm, right? I mean, there's a new paradigm every other year, and or you know every few, and um, the entire project of regulation is. Uh, precisely all about kind of identifying and adapting to that. So unless you're going to have a world where, um, you know, you dispense with sort of freedom of contract and everything else, that is just kind of the existential description of the regulation project. Um, you know, can we be better at it? Sure. Is this a good, um, I mean, so in that sense, actually, this is a welcome disruption um, in any number of fields in right. regulation. But I have no reason to uh, think that the regulatory um, uh, universe is unable to adapt to that. And actually, we have a, a, a remark in the Q&A by Kelly Jordan, which uh, echoes you because she says, in a way, it's a revival of an old story in the capital markets. The distinction between activity-based and entity-based regulation goes back decades to uh, the 1980s along US European lines. Um, so um, unfortunately, we'll have to stop there because we're at our uh, time. There are many other questions which to me are pointers to future discussions. Uh, Tim Clausen uh, suggested we revisit the, the March 2020 episode of turmoil in the markets, which raised additional questions about activity versus entity-based regulation in a, in a different context of funds versus market makers versus uh, clearing houses, uh, et cetera. Uh, Pierre Raffi asked about cryptocurrency and probably that should be the topic of a dedicated uh, session of financial statements, even though I've uh, perhaps been too much of a skeptic about cryptocurrencies in the, in the recent past. Uh, Pablo Perez uh, asked about how these uh, issues of regulatory architecture that we're, we've been discussing uh, may impact the, the landscape of financial services uh, over the next 10 years, and especially this question of narrow banking is that uh, the shape of things to come uh, versus the current uh, um, uh, existence of financial conglomerations. Um, so unfortunately, this will not be for today because um, time uh, is short. I also apologize again for our technical difficulties on the streaming platform, but for mainly I want to uh, thank very warmly uh, Fernando Restoy and uh, Anna Gelpern uh, for what I thought was an extremely thought-provoking um, set of uh, interactions on the questions that will continue to occupy us. We have uh, done several sessions in re the recent past on, uh, on this uh, issue of uh, you know, the new um, 
the, the, the new landscape with, uh, with big, big tech intruding in finance. And I think this will uh, remain a, a major uh, concern for this series and, uh, and beyond. In any case, many thanks again. Um, uh, and uh, I uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in other uh, sessions of financial statement. Actually, the next one uh, will be on uh, March 24, I think, uh, with, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, with Gary Cano, uh, a, a member of the European Parliament and Jeremy Settlemeyer, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, discuss uh, current areas of reform uh, in the banking space in Europe. Uh, so perhaps more traditional, but also very important. Thanks to everybody and have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much. Bye, thank you very much. Thanks.